so yeah, shielding was, they, had di they have different standards for, for personal safety in their ship designs. Okay, so why don't we get started back on ARCs. We didn't do too much on ARCs, we mostly told stories yesterday, but the uh, welding ARCs are electrically augmented flames. Now what I did tell you was that the electrons carry 99% of the current. The electrons are much more mobile because they're lighter, uh, they're in this electric field, and they will be accelerated. And they can be accelerated across that boundary layer, because what is the boundary layer on the surface of this impingement? If you have a flame, if you will, a hot gas, and we'll talk later about the electromagnetic forces that create, a, create this jet of gas. In a flame, you have the expanding PDV work you know, uh, of the hot gas of the flame caused a jet and whether it's a premixed flame or a jet burner, it turns out in an electric arc, you have electromagnetic forces that just in an open arc will essentially create that same type of jet effect, and we'll talk about that either today or tomorrow. Um, in any case, you have this jet, and you have a boundary layer down here. How can you get over the boundary layer? Well, in oxyacetylene cutting, we basically get around it because we have pure oxygen, we condense the boundary layer. Uh, but the other way of getting around it is to take these high mobility electrons, put them in an electric field, and have them punch their way through because they have 100 times the mobility of the ions. And the ions are the sluggish thing that creates the boundary layer. If you've got particles that run 100 times faster, then obviously you can get energies, energy carried by the electrons. And your question yesterday about is voltage important, it turns out, or how, I don't remember how you phrased it, how important is voltage? Voltage turns out not to be important, okay? We have this voltage, and we can plot the voltage, the cathode fall and the anode fall, but in fact, the cathode fall and the anode fall are these cooler regions where I don't have as many electrons because the plasma's cool, it's more of a neutral gas, but I have a high electric field, that's the slope of this thing, okay? Uh, high electric field, and the high electric field accelerates the electrons, they punch through the boundary layer, and they carry the energy with them. And it turns out 80 to 90 percent of the heat that we're going we're to see here in a second in the electric arc is carried by the um, uh, uh, electrons. And if I go back to this plot, that you ought to be getting sick of by now. Uh, if 10% of the heat is carried by the hot gas, and 90% is carried by the electrons, you get a factor of 10 increase in your heat intensity on the surface. Because 90% of your heat is due to those electrons. So we don't really care that much about the temperature of the arc. One of the first things a physicist does when he's told, you will now work on welding because we had a big welding problem that cost us hundreds of millions of dollars. And so some company will say, he'll take some physicist in the research department and he'll say, oh, I can measure the temperature of the arc. Because he thinks, like any heat transfer person, that the temperature of the gas is what controls the heat transfer. Not in, what, not in arcs, not in electric arcs. The electron distribution is what controls the heat transfer. The electrons carry 90% of the heat. That's not to say the hot gas doesn't carry something, but it's 10 or 20% max, okay? So essentially what we've done is we've used the electrons with their high mobility to overcome the gas boundary layer with the sluggish ions that just don't want to move. But the electrons are so much more mobile, they can punch through that boundary layer. Okay? Simple enough? Right? They never taught you that in high school, did they? It actually it turns out to be true. There's some interesting ways to prove it. Uh, but rather than going directly there at the moment, it turns out the heat intensity is, there's a paper you have by Metcalf and Quigley. You don't have to read these papers. Or it's not Metcalf and Quigley, it's Quigley, Quigley Richard Swift, Swift Hooking. Yeah, there is a paper by Metcalf and Quigley. Let's go back and see what it says. Anyway. Heat flow to the workpiece from a TIG welding arc. TIG just means tungsten inert gas. So your, your electrode is a piece of tungsten. You 
you're not melting the, the tungsten off, it's a, uh, and you're using an inert gas like argon or, or helium. We tip, that's what most people in, in Europe, these guys are from England, and in Europe they call it TIG. Um, they also have a feeding a wire of the material. If you're welding steel, you feed in a, a steel wire, and we call that MIG, metal inert gas, okay? The American Welding Society designation is not TIG, it's gas tungsten arc. You've got a tungsten electrode, it's an arc, and you're using an inert shielding gas. And it's not MIG in the United States, it's gas metal arc, because you've got a metal piece of steel or a piece of aluminum or a piece of titanium, and you've got a shielding gas, which can be various things, and you've got an arc. So we have a different designation, but they call this a TIG arc, and the TIG arc is the simplest arc, uh, because you're not melting electrodes as you're doing things, it's just an arc burning in air. And in fact, uh, the Germans used to sell loudspeakers that were nothing more than TIG arc, because the arc actually will respond at high frequencies up to about 100 kilohertz. So it has very good dynamic range for all you speaker buffs. These speakers cost about $10,000, and they have to have about a five kilowatt power supply, and they're not very efficient, but in fact, um, we have a power supply in the lab that was designed by the, the uh, engineer who runs the lab, Don Galler, that will uh, modulate the arc out to about, well, for full power up to a few hundred amps, it'll modulate it up to about five kilohertz, and it, with some roll off, it'll, it'll go up to 15 kilohertz. So we actually have hooked that up to a loudspeaker, as a, and you can hear yourself talk of the arc. You can use the arc as a, as a microphone. Um, and it, because the arc will expand and contract as you put more or less current through it, okay? And so it vibrates the air just like anything else. Now it turns out, um, Professor Lieb over here in electrical engineering uh, has been getting a fair amount of press the last couple of years because he basically has uh, been developing circuits so that you can use fluorescent lights, which also work at about 50 kilohertz. Um, you can use fluorescent lights as loudspeakers. So for a, if you want to have an emergency broadcast system through a building, you don't have to put speakers throughout the building. You just have to put this little frequency modulator on your fluorescent lights, and the fluorescent lights will talk to you. <laughs> so anyway, arcs, arcs can be very responsive electrically. But in, in uh, Quigley's paper, he talks about the heat, which people, physicists often use Q for heat. And the total heat going to the workpiece is equal to the heat of the electron, the electrons, the heat of convection, the heat of conduction, and the heat of radiation. Yeah. In uh, MIG welding, the anode that we lose to, I guess, kind of bind the pieces together. What in TIG welding is, I guess, the substrate they use to bind that? The, sub, the substrate is what you're welding. So if this is two pieces of steel, mm -hmm. and I want to weld that seam, I just TIG weld, I just run the arc across there and melt some of the material. I may or may, that add, may, or may not add fuse uh, filler metal. Okay, I guess the filler metal. How do you add the filler metal then if it's required if you have to... In a TIG arc, you basically have a separate... You have your your tungsten electrode and you just feed a wire in from the side. Okay. Kind of like a 30 degree angle. And just So you have a separate separate power supply. You have a heat source and a, and a wire power supply. In MIG, you just have a wire feed yep. and that's controlling the arc and we'll talk about that in some more detail. In fact, yesterday after class, I got an email from a guy saying that uh, uh, the convention center over here in South Boston, which is this 1,500-foot long building, it's only about five years old, they're welding stainless steel up there, and they wanted me to go over and look at the TIG welds. They're TIG welding 316 stainless steel, just little lap joints, but basically they had floods in the roof, and so apparently they had some big lawsuit or something. So they're over there repairing it, the guys are up there in these 40-mile-an-hour winds up there trying to make decent welds. Okay. They're not the greatest looking well. So they're not doing a bad job. They built a little tent to go around it and stuff, but uh, it's kind of lousy conditions up there. You know, 100 feet in the air, uh, 40 mile an hour winds trying to weld with the TIG arc. But, but, yeah. Why would they use the TIG arc versus like submerged metal arc or something? Well, this is 50,000 material. This is uh, just thin sheet okay. material. And submerged arc is the type of thing you typically use for half inch or greater. Uh, you could use submerged arc, but usually you don't. I've never seen submerged arc on anything less than a quarter of an inch. But 
because it's such a high heat input process. We can talk about some work start later. Um, the, uh, I actually recommended they consider because there's about two or three person years worth of effort. They've got 8,000 linear, linear feet of weld, TIG weld, they've got to make them the stainless steel. And that will take two or three person years of work, probably 6,000 hours, four to 6,000 hours. Uh, it's a slow process, TIG is a slow process. Very, in, in the shop, it's a very high quality process. One of the highest quality processes we have, but very slow. Uh, originally, they were going to build the sea cliff by MIG welding the titanium, okay, the titanium wire. And Mare Island uh, Naval Shipyard tried for a year, and they could not get the welding to work, even though David Taylor had spent several millions of dollars developing this process, which didn't quite work. It worked in the laboratory, sort of. Um, uh, and they finally ended up TIG welding the sea cliff, which took them another year. Power. Can you do that? I mean, is there a way to make that mobile so you can do it up 100 feet in the air? I mean, oh well, this is on top of the roof. I mean, oh, okay. you know, I was walking around up there. You didn't have to have a harness, but you are up there, and it's 40 mile an hour wind because you're on, you know, it's about 100 feet under a foot tall, tall building. When I mean the submerged metal arc, it's, it's like stick wood. Okay. Well, submerged arc. Well, that's what I, was, I just misheard what you said. There. True submerged arc. <clears throat> is like pouring sand on the joint. It's actually a welding flux. It costs about two bucks a pound. And you run the wire underneath. And we call it submerged because you can't see the arc. You don't need, you don't need goggles on because the arc is underneath the, 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 the bit of sand that's there. Okay? We call it submerged arc welding. And I mentioned that President Roosevelt wrote to uh, Churchill in World War II about this new welding process that was helping you know, build the ship so quickly. And we think they were talking about uh, submerged arc, which was invented by Union Carbide in 1936, but didn't get its big use until building delivery ships in World War II. But before that, everybody was just using sick electrode. MIG didn't come along until the early 1950s. TIG actually was being used in France, and the US Navy actually brought it over to the Philadelphia Navy Yard uh, in the, about 1940 to weld aluminum for aircraft. The Navy used to build their own aircraft. Okay, the Philadelphia Navy Yard. So the US Navy actually brought TIG welding to the United States. And it's still a very high quality process for welding. Uh, you can weld virtually anything with TIG uh, because the tungsten electrode's not melting in there. And you can add filler metal if you want. Or if you don't add filler metal, you put autogenous weld, which means you don't have any filler metal. Okay, so anyway, the, the heating going to the surface, most heating, I mean, if you got a radiator right over here in the corner, that heats the room in the winter by conduction, convection, and radiation. We call it a radiator. And actually, believe it or not, about half the heat that gets transferred to you from that radiator is by radiant, radiant heat, and conduction and convection are only about half, okay, together. Uh, we'll talk about, well, actually down here, it shows what these things are. But the electrode, they then break each one of these down and quantify them for a 100 amp TIG arc. And the electrical hit, well, let's, let's back up. A 100 amp TIG arc running at 10 volts is 1,000 watts. Okay, 10 times 100, I did that in my head. Mathematicians. Um, it's 1,000 watts, but only about 60 watts actually get into the anode. A lot of the rest of it goes off. It's only about 50% efficient. 60% efficient. Okay, we went back to my 10 to the third to 10 to the sixth, and I mentioned that flames were only about 2% efficient, and lasers and electron beams are 98% efficient. Well, in between there is the 50% efficiency about where arc welding 10 to the fourth is. Well, this is this thousand watts total wall plug power. Only about 50 or 60% gets to the workpiece. And if you go through their paper, I think they actually use 60%. But the electrical heat is the current. It's the electrons carrying the current times the work function voltage, and I'll explain what that is, the anode fall voltage, and the Thompson voltage. Okay, I'm going to break those out. And it turns out that's 25% of the 60, 20%, 4%. Conduction is 2%, convection is 2%, radiation is about 1%, evaporation is negative 2%. 
and the radiation from the pool is negative a half percent. This pool is radiating away and losing heat, okay? So you get the heat in, but some of it flows back out of there, right? So they add all, if you add all this up, you get 58% or you know, something, something on the order of a half for the total efficiency of heat into the metal. Okay, you can add the numbers up yourself. But let's talk right now about where this, these terms come from for the electrical heat. Each electron carries some energy, and that energy can bro be broken up into three things. It's considered that the energy of an electron sitting still in free space is the zero of energy for this thermodynamic analysis, okay, of the, of the heat here. So you can do, in thermodynamics, you, you can define your zero state of energy, and typically a free electron not bound to a metal, just sitting in the air stationary is considered zero energy, okay? Now, they're never sitting stationary. Um, in fact, they're at about 10,000 degrees. And 10,000 degrees is actually a considerable amount of heat. Anybody have any idea how to convert heat or uh, temperature to, uh, and voltage? There is an equivalence, okay? And basically, it says, the equivalence formula is that the electron volts, so if I'm accelerating an electron through an anode fall voltage of four volts, I would have four electron volts, that's an energy, and that's equal to Boltzmann's constant times temperature. Who was Boltzmann? Anybody know who Boltzmann was? Boltzmann was the physicist in Austria or somewhere, and he basically um, came up, anybody take statistical thermodynamics? Anybody take thermodynamics? None of you have taken thermodynamics? You're going to have to. They'd be better in your math class. <laughs> anyway, so Boltzmann, here's a picture of Boltzmann. When I teach my thermo class, I always like to give Ludwig von Boltzmann, 1844 to 1906. He came up with the formula that the entropy is Boltzmann's constant times the log of the number of possible states, of statistical states of all these gas atoms floating around. Okay. So if I have Avogadro's number of atoms or, and I'm mixing you know, A and B atoms, I can calculate statistically how many different arrangements of those atoms. And it turns out that can be related to the entropy. And this is his gravestone. And it actually has on his gravestone his formula. What a nerd, okay? A quintessential nerd, right? Or, as I sometimes say, if you only come up with one idea in your life, but Boltzmann's constant times temperature is, in fact, an energy. Because um, uh, temperature times entropy is an energy. And for those of you that have thermal. So this is an energy, and this is an energy. So I can rearrange this, and a voltage can be equivalent to Boltzmann's constant over the Coulomb charge. Uh, another little handy rule of thumb, which I'm sure you all know, if you're an electrical engineer, is 300 Kelvin is about 25 millivolts by this formula. Electrical engineers need to know that because you have electrical noise, thermal noise, and about, you can have, you have to handle about 25 millivolts of electrical noise at room temperature, okay? So you actually have to do some pretty fancy things to get your noise, to control your noise, because thermal noise of the electrons vibrating around because they have one half mv squared. They're not sitting stationary in space. They're going at tremendous velocities. And those tremendous velocities, if 300 Kelvin is equal to 25 millivolts, the temperature of the arc, at, if, it's, uh, if I have a uh, four volt uh, anode fall voltage, would be 12,000 Kelvin, okay? So it turns out that is about the temperature of the arc. It just so happens that, and the voltage, I'm sorry, 300 is 25 millivolts. The voltage, one volt is equivalent to 12,000 Kelvin, Kelvin, okay? Uh, what's, what's the E? Is the Coulomb charge. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 18 Coulombs per electron. Or is it 6.02 times 10 to the 19th electrons per coulomb? Something like that. 
if you take Avogadro's number, divide it by the Faraday constant, which is, so this is 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd, right? And you divide that by 96,500 coulombs, which is how many um, amperes there are in one Avogadro's number of atoms, you will end up with the Coulomb charge, E. Okay? Or number of electrons in a Coulomb. Okay? And if you take one over that, you get the Coulomb charge, which is like 1.6 times 10 to the minus 18. Okay? And you multiply that by volts and you get an energy. Oh, excuse me, I'm not learning much here, but that's how you do it. And that's how I remember it. Okay? Because I do remember that number and I remember that number. And I can derive the Coulomb charge from that. Okay. After a while you learn there's only a few things you need to know. You just kind of derive everything else from those things. In any case, um, we go back to all this. That Thompson voltage works out to uh, about 4% um, of this 1,000 watts, and that's uh, a fraction of a volt, okay? At 12,000 Kelvin, it's about one volt, okay, or so. So that's about a volt. The anode fall voltage, we showed you what the anode fall voltage was before. The anode fall voltage is these electrons that are in this hot gas plasma, because it's at 12,000 degrees and has a Thompson energy, has to, those electrons have to be accelerated across the gas boundary layer, and that's about four, let's say four volts, three or four volts. I don't remember what Beth or Quigley used, but it's three or four volts. Actually, they must have used about five volts because that's 20% of the energy. Okay? Now, um, so the energy of the electrons gained by being accelerated across the gas boundary layer is this, and it's about five times that. This is even larger because the electrons in a piece of metal are not in free space. They're bound to the metal. If they weren't bound to the metal, they would all evaporate off, and the metal would end up having no electrons. It would have a tremendous positive charge if it had no electrons, right? But in fact, the electrons want to be in the metal. And so they actually drop down to a lower energy state than the, sur than the energy of the surface of the metal, they are actually bound to what we call the Fermi level of the, of, the, uh, of the metal. And you have a little plot somewhere in your notes Oops. of this, which is a plot of so I have an electron, if I think of this as an energy scale, this is energy, um, and I have, this is the zero of energy, that's the stationary electron. I actually have a higher energy because it says in a hot gas up above, that's the Thompson energy. To get from the gas into the metal, it has to go across this anode boundary layer and it picks up about 20% of the center, the energy of the arc uh, by doing that. But then it decays down to the Fermi energy of the of the electrons in the metal. The electrons are bound to the metal by that energy, which is called the work function. In order to get an electron out of the metal, we call it the work function because the guys who were studying electron emission in the 1920s found that you had to apply about five volts in order to pull a strip an electron off that metal. Okay? Or actually you have to apply an electric field. And in fact, what happens when you get a steep enough electric field, you have a a potential from the surface that drops down like this to the Fermi level, and ordinarily the electrons can't get out, but if you apply a very steep electric field, you can actually bend this potential well, this is an energy well where the electrons are sitting at the lower energy in this well, you can drop the side walls with an electric field, and you can get electrons actually tunnel through here, quantum mechanical tunneling, uh, and so you can reduce the work function. If you have a high enough uh, electric field, a steep enough field gradient, you can strip the electrons out of there. That's called field emission. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Actually, it's not important, but a lot of people think it is. So in any case, we have 
the electron up here in free space with a certain thermal energy from the hot gas. It has to punch its way through the boundary layer and then it decays down into this energy well and gives up that energy. And that's the total electron energy, which in this case is 49% of the total energy in that arc from the wall plug. Conduction, we're not going to go through it if you want to read Metcalf's paper or Quigley's paper. They estimate conduction of the hot gases is about 4% of heat transfer. You get another 2% from convection, and radiation is about 1%. Yesterday, we talked about burning your eyeballs and you know getting sunburn, and two people came up to me afterwards to tell me some good stories about some guys who decided to weld in their skivvies one night on board ship, and the next morning they all had sunburn. Because they, there's a reason why, even in the hot summer, a welder wears long sleeves and gloves and you know basically there's no skin exposed because the radiant heat will give you a sunburn but that radiant heat is only about one percent of the energy in that from the wall plug it doesn't take that much to burn skin 140 degrees in you know hot water from your tap water in 10 seconds will burn you 180 degree water will scald you in a second and 200 degree water will give you second degree burns, you know, in, in a fraction of a second. That's why steam explosions are so bad and things. It doesn't take much to really damage skin, okay? And so the radiant heat is not that great, although 1% of 10,000 watts per square centimeter is 10 watts per square centimeter. And typical sun radiation on a nice sunny day is 0.03 watts per square centimeter. So 10 watts per square centimeter is about 300 times the intensity of the sun that gives you a sunburn in a few hours, right? Or whatever, if you're not protected. So that's why in, you know, for me, two minutes I got a sunburn on my hand when I was holding this thing without a glove on, okay? And these guys welding off on board ship one night in their skivvies, and yours was about a guy who got flashed. He actually wasn't welding, but he got flashed on an electrical panel and just the momentary flash, a fraction of a second, in a 400 amp or 400 volt arc, which typically, I don't know what the electrical panel fuse box was, but um, typically on a 400 amp system, you might get 30,000 amps for a fraction of a second. And that gives a lot of radiation, and basically the guy ended up being blind the next day, but two days later, he was fine, okay? Not something I recommend going blind every 24 hours once a month because it probably would damage your eyes long term. But, you know, you said you got a, a call that night, this guy was woke up and he couldn't see or something. Tough. Don't, don't do, do stupid things at the electrical panel box. That's why you have a lockout tag out, right? Anyway, um, evaporative heat loss is actually twice as much as radiation. This evaporative heat loss is important because it's basically, we'll talk about it later, it's what causes the, the welding fume. You see smoke coming up out of the well pool? That's vaporizing metal, which is condensing to form very fine powder. That very fine powder, people will breathe in. Now, if you're welding carbon steel, there is no evidence that welding carbon steel will create a problem for your lungs. Now, people do uh, do studies on welders, and they show they get siderosis, which means iron in the lungs. But they actually use, over here at Harvard School of Public Health, iron fume as the non-toxic control. They ingest iron, iron powder into rat's lungs, along with some other things. But the control experiment is they use iron powder because iron is basically, iron oxide is basically dirt, okay? People have been breathing dirt for millennia, right? And if, if dirt could, could kill you, we'd all be dead. But certainly all those people from a millennia ago, they are all dead, but nonetheless, uh, they may be other reasons than just breathing in some, some dust and dirt. There are certain types of things, uh, fumes, that can be harmful. Um, I was participated in some studies over at Harvard School of Public Health because people worry about chromium. Some of you know the Navy wants to build a high chromium submarine because it's not magnetic. Well, it turns out the uh, uh, EPA and OSHA will probably shut that project down, okay, because um, uh, hexavalent chromium is a known carcinogen, 
and you can tell this by looking at um, well, it's getting harder now. That's getting back further. In the in the 1970s, most bumpers on cars were chrome plated, and then around the late late 70s, early 80s, people discovered that the people who worked in these chromium electroplating shops had a very high incidence of lung cancer, and they attributed it to hexavalent chromium, CrO3. Okay. Plenty of studies to show that. Um, Hexavalent, so we got six pluses on this, okay, on the chromium. Okay. Uh, chromium ion is six pluses. Now, tetravalent or trivalent chromium is nowhere near as bad. Um, we did some work for the, the Navy a few years ago to show that the concentration, the theoretical concentration of the hexavalent chrome in welding film is like one part to ten, ten to the twelfth. Okay. So there's not much hexavalent chrome in welding film. Although if you actually analyze the fume, you find that it might be one part in a thousand and one part in ten thousand. And that's still pretty low uh, and not shouldn't be very harmful, but if you over ingest and put a lot of stainless steel welding fume in rat's lungs, his lungs will start to respond and give off enzymes and other things that say that the lungs are distressed. They don't like the chromium in there. And in fact, the, the difference between this eight orders of magnitude of how much hexavalent chrome is probably because in the welding arc, you're not actually forming hexavalent chrome, but once it gets out in the moisture in the air, humidity in the air, that fume oxidizes and it probably does start forming hexavalent chrome. Okay, so um, I was on a number of phone calls, conference calls with NAVC about four or five years ago because the EPA was about to shut down Newport News Shipyard down. Uh, they were about to come out with some regulations that would have shut down all stainless steel welding in the shipyard. Okay. So, uh, and eventually OSHA did come out with requirements that are the stiffer requirements. It's not clear that it really should apply to welding. It does apply to electroplating shops. And so getting back to the automobiles, in the 1970s you saw chrome plated bumpers. If you go back to the first minivans, you actually saw aluminum bumpers with a rubber strip. And then you saw plastic bumpers in the mid 80s. And that's because they shut down, they had to close these electric plate shop, shops immediately in around 1980 when they discovered this problem with hexavalent chrome. Because they didn't have the environmental controls. And then around 1990, some of the Ford Explorers started coming out with chrome bumpers again. That's because Ford spent hundreds of million dollars, of millions of dollars on a nice plant with all the environmental controls to keep the hexavalent chrome, you know, vapor out of the atmosphere so people weren't, they weren't killing their workers. So you actually can see cars now have plastic bumpers, uh, chrome plated bumpers, you know, there's lots of different, I mean, it's a design choice for people now. But if you went back to 1975 or earlier, every bumper, you know, was chrome plated. And then they couldn't do it, and then they you see this transition in the 1980s because of the hexavalent chrome problem. And it's still a problem for a number of things. Now, um, any questions? Yeah. Are, are there any uh, adverse you know, occupational or environmental, like using anti spatter spray, the fumes that come from that? Uh, nothing I've ever heard of. I mean, anti spatter spray, I'm not, I'm not even sure exactly what. Uh, what is in it? I think it's basically some uh, uh, kind of a it's a a vehicle that probably puts down some little ceramic, very fine ceramic powders. Okay, um, depending on those powders, if they got dry, if they were dry and got airborne, and they are ceramic powders, they, if they were silica powders, they could get you could get silicosis in the lungs, and that could be harmful. But I don't. I've never heard of anybody being worried about that. First of all, because you're not, it's not like just dry powder, okay? And if you're worried about silica powder, you're gonna have to quit brushing your teeth because one of the fillers in toothpaste is fine silica powder, okay? There's a company here in Boston, headquarters are here in Boston called Cabot Corporation. And Cabot Corporation has the basic patents in most of the world market on making fumed silica where they take silicon, uh, Silicon monoxide gas, I think. Anyway, they basically uh, 
burn uh, some silicon compound in a rarefied atmosphere and they make very finely divided colloidal SiO2. And it's put into foods, it's put into toothpaste, and just as a, as a filler material. Uh, they also make carbon black, and they basically burn oil in a rarefied atmosphere, and just make a tremendous amount of smoke, and make soot, if you will. And that goes into tires, you know, rubber tires and things. There's a huge market for carbon black in the world, okay? Um, and there's a very big market for perfumed silica. So just because something is known to cause hazards under certain conditions, it turns to people who really get silicosis are the miners. And it turns out people have shown that it's the freshly fractured silica that's really bad. There's an electric charge on that surface of the fractured silica, which you know, silica is just sand, right? But if you're in mining and you're breaking up rocks, you're freshly fracturing the rocks, and if that dust gets down in your lungs, it's very potent. In some of these studies over at Harvard School of Public Health, they take old silica powder or fume silica, and the rats, well, they might respond. I mean, if someone threw, you know, half a cup of dust into your lungs, you'd be coughing and sputtering too. I mean, it's kind of interesting to watch these rats. <laughs> uh, uh, but in terms of iron oxide, you basically suffocate the rat before he, he starts his lungs start throwing off chemicals and saying, I don't like this. With fume silica, he throws off some chemicals, but a very low level. You take freshly ground silica, and it just, the, the enzymes just go skyrocket, okay? Because it's actually the electric charge on the freshly fractured surface. After that surface gets exposed to the humidity of the air and everything, it basically passivates, and it's not anywhere near as harmful. So a lot of these things that people say, oh, you shouldn't remember, Used to be you, sh you shouldn't eat eggs because of the cholesterol, and now eggs are good for you. You weren't supposed to eat butter, and you're supposed to, you know, now you can eat butter, and it's actually better for you than margarine. You know, I mean, the doctors don't really know what they're talking about. So, um, when my wife tells me to go get a sandbox for my two-year-old, uh, as long as the pallet of sand has been sitting there for a couple weeks at Lowe's, I can get the non-silica-free sand. Well, you don't even have to worry about that because you're not going to get the 10 micron or less sand. I mean, 10 micron is like baby powder, or less, okay, finer. And it turns out it's not respirable to get down in your lungs in less than 10, less than, between one and 10 microns, okay? Because, um, and for all of you nav air people, of which there are none of you here, but for example, they blew up a bunch of helicopter engines in the first Gulf War because it's sort of sandy over there in the Far East, or not Far East, and they didn't always use their engineer particle separators. And so if you just ingest you know, silica sand at hundreds of miles an hour into this engine, it does a wonderful job of sandblasting the engine and gives nothing within a few minutes or a tenth of minutes, right? Fairly expensive. An engineer particle uh, separator on an engine is nothing more than something that requires the particles to go around a corner, kind of a U corner, to get into the engine. You have the same thing that nature gave you. It's called your nose. It has to go up and around. And if you've ever worked in a dusty environment, you know when you blow your nose, you just separated out the particles. The finest ones, didn't, or the, only the finest ones, could turn the corner. It's the momentum of that particle trying to turn the corner. And it runs into the wall, and it gets stuck in the mucus, and you blow your nose, and that's how your body gets rid of it. Except if it's 10 microns. Now you're getting down to an aerodynamic di diameter that the particle's mass is small enough that it will be carried in the free stream around your nose and into your lungs. And that's called a respirable pow par particle. Your kids don't play in a sandbox of respirable powder. Okay? If they did, you'd have other problems. Okay? Yeah. I mean, it's a very fine powder. And the ones less than about two microns get carried with air so well, they actually go into the lungs and they come right back out when you exhale. So it's kind of two to 10 microns, a very narrow range. Guess where welding fume sits? Most of the welding fume sits because it's condensed from vapors, tends to be in the respirable range. Welding spatter, you know, no one ever breathed in welding spatter, okay? It either got stuck in their lungs or they ate it. 
okay? But it didn't get down to the lungs. And if it gets in your stomach, it just corrodes. Your stomach is pH 2 or 1.5 or so. Question over here? Isn't that why asbestos is so bad? Because Exactly. Asbestos, asbestos is interesting because, so here's your 10 micron particle, here's your 2 micron particle. The problem with asbestos is asbestos fibers can be 100 microns long. Okay, this is 10 and this is 2. And these are respirable particles that will go around those U-turns with the, with the gas flow because their aer aerodynamic diameter is such that they can be carried with the momentum of the flow and not hit against the walls as they try to turn the corners. The asbestos fiber, which could be 1 or 2 microns or less in diameter, but 100 microns long, has what we call a mean aerodynamic diameter that happens to be in the respirable range, even though it's too long to be in the respirable range. And in fact, in your, in your body, you have, uh, in your lungs, you have these vacuum cleaners, these cells that are called macrophages. And they basically run around your lungs and they eat up anything that's foreign in your lungs. They just kind of, they're fairly large cells and they might be 20 microns in size. And so they can eat up 10 micron and two micron powder. So people are, you're breathing in um, respirable powders in this room with every breath. You're breathing in millions of powders every day, uh, particles. But the macrophages are in there like little vacuum cleaners running around, like the iRobot or you know, I, you know, the vacuum cleaner, cleaning up your lungs because they are bigger than these and they basically can consume them. And there's certain little areas in the cells. Now you're getting way beyond my. I'm not a biologist, but basically, the acids inside the cell actually break some of these things down. Well, the problem here is these asbestos fibers. It turns out OSHA doesn't even ask you to report, I think it's less than 5 micron fibers or less than 10 micron fibers. Why? Because the macrophage can, can, can wrap around those fibers. But if this is the macrophage, it can't wrap around 100 micron fiber because it's bigger than the macrophage. And so I've seen pictures in the scanning electron microscope of macrophages that look like someone shot a javelin through it. It's as best as fiber that it tried to consume. But in fact, the fiber is destroying the cell walls of the macrophage. And the asbestos is so refractory, asbestos won't dissolve in pH 2. Okay? It's, very, it's a very, very refractory uh, acid-resistant compound. There, by the way, asbestos is the name of a whole class of minerals with a bunch of different chemical formulas. And some of them are worse than others. Okay? Chrysotyl asbestos is nowhere near as bad as amphibole asbestos, the blue asbestos that comes from South Africa. So some asbestos is much worse than others. Uh, so there are different asbestoses so far as that goes. But asbestos can get down in the lungs even though it's larger than the macrophage because the long fiber actually goes with the flow just like a log going down the stream of a river, right? It doesn't hit the sides even though, you know, because it goes with the flow. Okay, so that's one of the problems with asbestos. And people are getting worried about other fibers too, glass fibers fiberglass, you know, whether those will do the same thing that asbestos uh, does, and it's sort of a, uh, sort of, uh, still a, an open, open question. Uh, people are still debating in the literature. So how do we get off on asbestos? You asked me about asbestos, I was going to. Um, now, uh, there are, they did put asbestos in welding electrodes, so it's just I've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, if you go back to you know the 1880s where they had bare electrodes, then they started coating them in the around 1910 with mud, you know, the flux coated electrodes, or the paper, the cellulose coated. The cellulose coated electrodes had well, let me back up. In the 1930s, they actually used to take asbestos tubing. Okay, you can you can weave asbestos into cloth and stuff. And they'd stick a wire inside the asbestos tube and they would use pure asbestos as the flux. Okay? It makes, it's not a bad flux. But, um, and so there are reports 
done studies done in shipyards of the health of workers back in the 1930s, and it says they were using asbestos electrodes, but they were nothing like the asbestos electrodes that were being produced in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and, and up through um, about 1980 is approximately when they finally got the asbestos out of the electrodes. But the E6010 electrodes, um, uh, uh, and E6011, the cellulosic electrodes, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s actually contained anywhere from one to, let's say, 5% asbestos fiber. And the reason they contained asbestos fiber was because you wanted a high temperature source of moisture in those electrodes. Asbestos is a hydrated mineral. It's got H2O in it, okay? But it doesn't evaporate off the H2O until about 800 or 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It is the, the water is chemically bound to the mineral very tightly, and asbestos binds the water better than virtually any other mineral in the world. And so it will release a little bit of moisture into that cellulosic electrode at very high temperatures right at the tip of the arc. And it will change the arc characteristics, and maybe tomorrow we can talk about that. By the way, someone, someone's going to be But you end up getting a very strong plasma jet uh, off the tip of this electrode, okay? You get a much stronger jet. The jet ordinarily off the tip of a non-asbestos containing electrode or a non-high temperature moisture electrode might depress the surface of that weld pool by half a millimeter or a millimeter. But if you put some high temperature moisture like asbestos in there, and it only takes you know, one or two percent, you actually get a very strong, very focused arc that will actually dig right into the surface of the weld metal by two or three millimeters, and it makes a beautiful first first uh, pass for a pipe weld joint where you can't get to the inside. You basically kind of gouge your way through with this strong plasma jet. So there's some fairly sophisticated things going on here, and. It was the reason they didn't take it out immediately is because you wouldn't have been able to weld in 1978. They did start taking it out of some that didn't really need it, uh, but it wasn't until like 1981 or so they finally reformulated all of them, and they came up with something, a mineral, and it does it has a funny name like flora something. It doesn't have any chlorine in it. You don't want chlorine. I told you you get phosgene gas and it had chlorine, but it has a name sort of like, sort of like chlorine. And it holds its moisture to about 700 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? But it's number two, and that's what people use in the 6010 electrodes today, and the old timers can tell the difference. The guys who used to weld with the asbestos containing electrodes still say they're better, you know? I mean, I can't tell, because when I was welding with asbestos containing electrodes, I didn't know about it, and I wasn't a good enough welder to know, okay? But the guys who were, you know, professional welders welded all the time could tell the difference when they switched the formulation and got rid of the asbestos. In the meantime, because there was asbestos in these things, in these electrodes, there are now about 100,000 lawsuits out there where people claim, or trying to sue the welding industry, claiming that they got their asbestosis from, um, from the welding electrodes. There is absolutely no evidence that's true because it turns out 50% of that electrode is water glass, and water glass is a blue that completely encapsulates the asbestos. And so you don't get free asbestos fibers, you don't get respirable fibers that are small enough to get down in your lungs from welding. No one has ever shown that you can get a free asbestos particle by breaking the flux off of an asbestos containing uh, welding electrode. Nonetheless, that doesn't keep people from suing. Uh, of that. There are many welders who did get as asbestosis, but that's because they were knocking insulation off the pipe covering, okay, to replace pipes. That's because they were lining furnaces with asbestos. That's because they would use free asbestos to insulate things. And in fact, there's one place in Pennsylvania and one place in Idaho. I've read stories of the free asbestos comes as kind of a white powder. If you mix it with some some water and stuff, you could pack it in as insulation. And in these plants, these guys used to have asbestos ball fights. Okay? 
so they were throwing you know, raw asbestos uh, with water at each other. Uh, so there are people who go in there and chip out the asbestos out of a furnace and they come out white, okay? They were breathing asbestos, but it wasn't from welding electrodes. Now, what about if you grind those wells? They, they need to no, the asbestos is consumed at, um, uh, it decomposes at around 1,200, uh, somewhere between 900 and 1,200. It decomposes at 900, gives off its moisture, it's no longer asbestos, no longer in a fibrous form, and does no harm. That was one of the first theories in the early 90s. We blew that one out of the water, okay? Uh, no asbestos fiber. In fact, there was one guy who did a study once, uh, a plaintiff's expert, who uh, actually found some asbestos electrodes, set up his little glove box to count the asbestos fibers. There were four asbestos fibers per cubic centimeter in the glove box before he started the test, and when he did the test, he measured zero asbestos fibers because this, the, the gas is brought into the arc and destroys it. He called it the vacuum cleaner effect. <laughs> that the arc was actually destroying asbestos that was naturally occurring in the air. As you sit in this room, there is probably about one or two uh, fibers per cubic centimeter. You're breathing in about 10 cubic meters a day, so if you calculate all that out, you breathe like four or 5,000 asbestos fibers per day into your lungs just because of asbestos that's in the air from all the other sources of asbestos. So, you know, 4,000 fibers a day, 10,000 fibers a day will not give you asbestos. It's when you came in white, okay, and you were breathing in, you know, grams of asbestos and trillions and quadrillions of fibers a day. That's what gives people asbestos, but not one or two fibers, okay, because every one of us breathes about 4,000 fibers a day, okay, just sitting here. If you go to the Yukon, you're down to about 1,000 fibers a day. 